In this module, we'll look at computer operating systems, operating systems like Windows XP, Linux, and Mac OS. We'll see what the operating systems do and give a brief history of some of these operating systems that are in use today. We've seen that computer hardware represents the data and instructions as ones and zeros using transistors. We've looked at computer hardware where the transistors are grouped as chips on, on boards, and we've seen the various formats for representing data in binary, such as JPEG and ASCII. Here is the computer's operating system. It's listed as system software. Software that comes with your computer to control the hardware and provide a user interface for you to interact with the computer. Things like deleting files, moving files around, is you using the, the operating system's user interface to interact with the computer. Also, you use computer programs. Programs like Microsoft Word and games, they work with the computer operating system to work with the hardware on your computer. The main function of the operating system is threefold. It runs programs, programs like Microsoft Word, games, instant messaging applications. It provides a user interface for you to do things with files and to control aspects of your computer. And it manages the hardware. It allows you to set the screen resolution, install new devices. Now again, the operating system is software. It's really a program running on the hardware like any other program. But its job is to run programs, provide an interface for you to do things like file deletion, file creation, and it manages the hardware of your computer. Let's look at how a computer boots itself. You've probably all heard the term that the computer is booting. Booting comes from the phrase pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, which means to independently start yourself without help. So when a computer is turned on, it independently starts functioning, and its functioning involves getting its operating system working. The operating system is stored somewhere permanently, like all programs. Typically, it's stored on the hard drive of the computer. So booting as we see here, takes the computer's operating system, which is stored on the hard drive, and moves it into RAM, where it can execute like any other program. So, booting is the procedure of bringing the operating system from the hard drive into RAM. And you see that a copy is still kept on the operating system. Now, I say that it's typically brought in from the hard drive. There's actually a hierarchy that the computer goes through looking for where the operating system might be. First, it looks on a floppy drive, if you have one, to see if there's an operating system on the floppy drive that it can use to put into RAM and boot. If it doesn't find it on the floppy drive, typically next it will look on a CD. And the last place it looks is on the hard drive. Take a moment and think why the computer would look for the operating system on devices in this order. The reason is that the primary operating system that the computer uses is stored on the hard drive. Almost all the time, a vast majority of the time when you boot your computer, the operating system is pulled off of the hard drive and brought into RAM. The problem is that if the operating system has a problem, say a virus or some kind of corruption, and it itself becomes inoperational, then the entire computer doesn't work. So the computer is set up to first look for an operating system coming off an external device like a floppy or a CD so that a clean operating system can be brought in and get the, get the computer up. This is why that when you buy a computer and it comes with CDs that are either called restore CDs or sometimes called operating system CDs that you keep the CDs because they are a pristine copy of the operating system that will can always bring your computer back to life if there was an operating system problem. Let's take a closer look 
at some of the purposes of the operating system, running programs, providing a user interface, and managing the hardware. Now running programs we're not going to look too deeply at. Basically what happens is when you double click a program like say the icon for Microsoft Word, you'll notice that the computer takes a few seconds before Microsoft R Word runs. During this time, the operating system is finding Microsoft Word's program as it resides in the hard drive and bringing it into RAM, and then starting the execution of Microsoft Word. So, the operating system is what actually finds and runs a program when you request a program to be executed. Next, let's look at how the operating system provides a user interface. There are two forms of user interfaces provided by operating systems. The old style interface was strictly a text-based interface. And here you see what's called a command prompt or a DOS window in Windows in a Windows operating system. In the early 1980s through uh, the mid to late 1980s, most computer operating systems looked like this. The entire screen was a dark screen with a prompt, as you're seeing here, to which you could type commands. And you had to learn a, a large number of somewhat esoteric commands. For instance, deleting everything from the floppy drive, you had to type del space star, star dot star meant delete everything from the floppy drive. And there were a number of these commands that you had to learn. Also, when you typed in, a, when you run to run, wanted to run a program, you would type it in, the program's name, and the computer would run it, run it to completion, and then run another program. This is a text-based interface. It's still available on most Windows-based computers. In fact, in other parts of the course, you will be using DOS commands to do things so you'll actually see how you can bring up a DOS interface in Windows and use it. The most prevalent form of e interface is called a graphical user interface or sometimes called a GUI. This is what most people work with and is probably familiar to you. A GUI uses something called a WIMP paradigm, windows where there are multiple windows in your screen icons, little pictures for things, menus of commands, and a pointer controlled by the mouse specifying where action is going to occur on your screen. Again, a vast majority of you will interact with programs through a graphical user interface. Although there are still some uses for text-based interfaces in DOS-like commands that are still used in some aspects, and you'll see that some Linux operating systems still use primarily a text-based interface. Now let's move on to look at the final aspect of the main purpose of an operating system, how the operating system manages your computer hardware. And there are three classes of computer hardware that we're going to discuss. How the operating system manages your CPU, how the operating system manages the RAM, and how it manages all other hardware. Let's start with the CPU. The operating system manages the CPU using two ideas, one called multitasking and one called time sharing. The idea is that modern computers are so fast and so powerful that most of the time the computer is sitting there saying, what instruction do you want me to do? What instruction do you want me to do? It's sitting there idle. Even if you have multiple instant messages going on, you're playing an MP3, you're surfing the web, <coughs> you're typing a term paper as fast as you can, 99.9% .9 of the time, the computer is doing nothing. CPUs are that powerful. So operating systems seek to take advantage of that by allowing multiple things to run on a computer at the same time. at the same time really means concurrent and concurrent means that multiple programs are active at the same time there's only one CPU and the CPU 
only can do one instruction at a time. So when you have multiple instant messaging windows and an MP3 player playing a song and you're typing a paper, at any instant in time, the CPU is doing one little part of one of those applications. It's just that it can do billions of instructions per second, so it can switch among the different applications. If you hit a key, it will read your keystroke, but in the computer's world, the time between you hitting one key and the next key is a very long time. In that time, it might swap out Microsoft Word that was reading the keystrokes and bring in the MP3 player to play a note of your next song. It then might swap out the MP3 player and check to see if an instant messaging application has a message that's come in. It can do this all very quickly. This is called multitasking, where the computer has multiple tasks that it's doing for a single user. A similar idea on more powerful computers is called time sharing. And time sharing is where that CPU is shared among different users. For instance, the computer science department web server can serve multiple different requests coming in from all over the internet for web pages. Two people might request a web page at the same time and they might both get it back very quickly thinking that they had exclusive use of the web server. In actuality, the web server is serving part of the page to one person and then to another person and then possibly other people. It does so in a round-robin fashion so that each person gets service that appears to be exclusive because the computer's CPU is so quick that the operating system can make it look like each person is the only one using the computer. The operating system manages RAM using a technique called virtual memory. The idea is that the computer has a fixed amount of physical RAM say 256 megabytes of RAM. Now it's possible that all of the applications that you're running concurrently, multiple instant messaging windows, Word, MP3 player, it's possible that those applications need more RAM than is physically available in the computer. All applications, in order to run, need their programs and the data they're working on in RAM. All programs of data go to RAM so that it's fast access for the CPU. But with multiple concurrent applications, many of them large and complex, they may not all be able to fit in the physical RAM. So what the operating system does is it takes part of the program and data that's necessary and puts it into RAM. And it takes parts of several different programs that are running concurrently. Then if the program needs more RAM, the operating system will take out of RAM one of the other concurrent programs and send it back to storage in a temporary place on disk. So for instance, if you have an instant messaging program up and an instant message hasn't come in for a long time, the operating system might take some of the code and data for instant messaging out of RAM and store it temporarily on the hard drive. Now, it wouldn't take out any of the code that's doing the display on the screen because you'd still need to see that. But code that's not necessary because it's not being used can be stored temporarily on the hard drive. Then, if an instant message comes in, that code would be retrieved by the operating system from the hard drive and brought into RAM and something else. Perhaps um, you hadn't typed in your word processing for a while some of the word processing code might be moved out to the hard drive. This idea of swapping active programs from RAM to the hard drive temporarily so that you can get more concurrent programs running is called virtual memory. Now, virtual memory allows more concurrent programs, but at the cost of speed. If you had more physical RAM in your computer, then the operating system wouldn't have to do this swapping in and out and each of the applications would run faster. Your computer manages all other hardware using something called a driver. A driver is a piece of code that goes into the operating system 
to control a specific device. So there are drivers for Hewitt Packard HP 1500 printers. And then there's a driver for the Hewitt Packard HP 255 printer. There's a driver for a Canon digital camera to allow downloading of pictures from the digital camera to the computer. There's a driver for a Kodak digital camera. It's different from the Canon digital camera driver. Each piece of hardware needs a driver so that the operating system knows how to communicate with that piece of hardware. Typically when you buy some hardware, a digital camera, um, a scanner, um, even a monitor or a keyboard or a mouse, typically the hardware will come with a CD that has the driver on it. Now most name brand manufacturers have already installed their drivers in a Windows based operating system so that if you plug in your Hewitt Packard printer the chances are the driver is already installed in the operating system. However they provide you with the CD in case the operating system can't find the driver it will ask for it from the CD. Again most name brand manufacturers also put all drivers for their hardware on their company website for free download because without the driver your computer cannot use that piece of hardware so it's important to keep the CDs that come with your hardware and if you happen to lose them know that you can typically go to the manufacturers website and get the driver you need for your hardware so in summary we see that the operating system runs programs, provides a user interface for you to work with operating system functions like deleting files, dragging a file to trash is you working with the user interface of the operating system to delete a file. And the operating system manages your hardware, the CPU through things like multitasking and time sharing, your RAM through virtual memory, and all other hardware by using drivers provided with the hardware.